Uh, my name is Sharon Bodo and I'm interviewing Mr. Eli Bowen for the Oral History Workshop sponsored by Ontario County Historical Society and Wood Library in Canada, New York. We are recording this interview at Ontario County Historical Society. And today is Thursday, February 24th, 2022. <laughs> Great year. <laughs> I'll let my own interview. So Eli, thank you for agreeing to be interviewed. Um, and I'm interested in hearing about your experiences growing up in Canandaigua, um, especially in uh, on Howell Street, as you indicated, and uh, also maybe in general, the neighborhood in general, um, which where I also reside now, mm -hmm. so um, nearby. So uh, if, uh, if you'd like, I'll maybe introduce yourself, tell us a little bit about yourself, and uh, I'll follow up with questions. Okay. Um... Well, just for completeness sake, my full name is Elliot, with one L and one T. My middle name is Hyde, H-Y-D-E, and my last name is Bowen. And um, I guess I, uh, I don't have a big plan for what I want to say, but I thought I've been wanting to write down some family history. I've been investigating my family history and thought maybe I could uh, fill in some blanks for other family members about my life. Uh, but since that's pretty open-ended, I thought, well, just for purposes of this, maybe just talk about living in Canandaigua and growing up here. So uh, we, my family and I, uh, moved here in 1960, I think during the summer of 1960, and at that time uh, I was three years old. Uh, my birth date is September 30th, so I was getting close to four years old. I have an older brother, John, John Christian Bowen, who's two years older, and a younger brother, David Farnham Bowen, who's two years younger. Uh, my parents are uh, both deceased, but my father's name was John Farnham Bowen, and my mother's name was Ruth Mathia Macaulay Bowen. Uh, my father was an internist here in town, uh, and my mom was a, uh, well, she was trained in art history and became a, uh, an art teacher. She'd been doing that for a few years uh, in various places before we moved here. Um, and uh, uh, I guess I have to look into the dates, but she, uh, she was basically a homemaker taking care of my brothers and me uh, for the early parts of our childhoods, and then uh, she started teaching again. But um, when we first moved to town, we uh, my parents bought a house at 57 Perry Place, mm -hmm. which was a double house down near the end of the street. And um, my memories of living there, that, that's the first place I lived that I have really good memories about uh, earlier than that. We, we came from Syracuse, where my dad had uh, a residency. And uh, I don't remember too much about our house there. My memories are pretty vague, but uh, I do remember a lot about growing up on Perry Place. Um, and when we first moved to town, my dad uh, opened an office at the corner of Gibson and Main Street, where uh, Dave Whitcomb's law office is now. Um, and I have pictures of us visiting him there and uh, um, some memories of him having that office. But after just, I think, about two years, uh, he joined the Candigma Medical Group which at that time was in what is now the Wood Library. Oh, right, right. Um, and so he had, and that was 
right next door to Thompson Hospital, which later moved to Paris Street, and the medical group moved along with it and built a new building. Um, so, uh, living in Perry Place, um, <laughs> uh, what can I say about how, it? How long did you live in Perry Place? We lived there, uh, we moved, um, well the way I date it is, I re is by the JFK assassination. Uh -huh. <laughs> Because I remember hearing about that the president had been shot uh, from our bus driver, and that was the Six bus three. that yeah. So that at that point we were living on Howell Street. We moved to eighty two Howell Street. I think in the summer. I'm not sure exactly when we moved, but we were there by the fall of sixty three, and. Uh, um, but I remember uh, the bus driver telling us, uh, it's funny because everybody has different stories about how mm -hmm. they heard about it, mm -hmm. and a lot of kids apparently heard about it in school, but I don't think, I was just in second grade, and I don't think they wanted to let us know. Uh, and so the bus driver was the one who told us. Mm -hmm. And I remember at the time, he told us that the president had been shot with a machine gun. Oh, and, uh, wow. and being a very judgmental little kid, I thought, that guy's really dumb. He doesn't know anything. Mm -hmm. He thinks, you know, after I found out the real story, my opinion of the bus driver went <laughs> way down. down. Although I always, I remember his, I like, liked the way he wore his uniform. He, he had a very neat uniform shirt and he rolled up his uh, cuffs in a way I thought, <laughs> that was I would like to do that someday. I want to be that is cool enough driver, to do that. The cool bus driver. Yeah, but I didn't think much of his knowledge of current events. Mm -hmm. um, but anyway, um, so Perry Place, uh, mm -hmm. my memories of that, we, uh, my parents owned the house and they rented out the other side to a family called the McElwains. And uh, they had a couple of younger kids who were younger than my brothers and me. And my main memory of them is kind of playing with their kids, but they were a little younger than us, so we, we were not super into playing with them. But we used to uh, go up through the attic and, into, the other and side. into their house. Uh, we figured out we could do that, and they didn't appreciate that too much. So, but we did that a few times until we got yelled at. And said, nah, Walk kids. up at it. Yeah, uh, those are fun. Yeah, we have one. Most dangerous thing you can have in a house <laughs> for collecting things. So that, so you were there a couple of years. You started at school. Time. Yeah, so I guess we were there for three, about three years, mm -hmm. um, and yeah, right. so. Um, a couple of the things that I remember is uh, about the, the high school at that time was on Main Street right. and it was at the period where the, the high school was really overcrowded. So they were having double shifts and my memory of that <laughs> was, it's kids have no idea what's mm -hmm. normal and what's not, mm -hmm. but my memory is of all these changes of kids you know, high school kids going because they were there were literally two shifts, and so there was a lot of movement of kids going to school and coming home from school. So there are, there are all these always these big crowds of high school kids up on Main Street, and uh, uh, but we, you know, when we started school, uh, well, I. My first experience was, uh, I guess, kind of a daycare at the Methodist Church basement, which I think I did for a year or so. Was and it then, a preschool, like yeah. nursery school, preschool? Yeah, mm -hmm. and then uh, I went to kindergarten at the primary school with Miss Hennahan. Um, my, I don't have too memory, too many memories of that, but uh, I remember taking naps. 
which always seemed bizarre as a kid. It was like, what? So I don't remember having to take naps at home. Maybe we did, but I just don't <laughs> remember. Wrong. Was that half day or full day kindergarten when you that, started? I don't really know. I seem to remember it was a full day, but I don't, like I'm day. not sure. Yeah. But the, the thing I remember most dramatically was uh, one of the things we had to learn was to tie our shoes. Mm -hmm. And I had a big uh, struggle with that. It took me a long time. And I didn't actually learn it in school. Mm -hmm. My grandmother, my mom's mother, was the one who actually taught me. And I remember her doing it on her, the steps of her house. She would just go over and over it with me until I finally got it. But in uh, kindergarten, we had a giant shoe that was large enough to like, get inside, is the way I remember it, <laughs> with huge laces. And, and somehow they thought, well, this will, you know, you can tie these huge laces, you can tie your own shoes, but it's a very different experience, and it didn't seem to help me learn how to do it, but I wonder... I wonder if they still have it. Yeah, I wonder, That's and I an wonder how big the thing artifact. was. Yeah. For a child, it probably seemed enormous. Yeah, I mean, I remember it being like, you know, five feet tall. Well, they're hovered, I guess, maybe. I really have no idea how big um, it really was, right? It's, it's really interesting, though. Never seen anything for tiny shoes. Yeah, I, I. So you were? Did you walk to school from Perry Place over um, to the primary? We we walked to school and we took the bus. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't remember. I think it was the way I remember it. My memory is very undependable. It was that it was just a day by day thing? But for the ancients. Yeah. 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 Um, but it seemed just as easy either way because mm -hmm. to get on the bus we had to go all the way up to the top of Perry Place and then I think we went over to uh, Buffalo Street, the corner, to get the bus. Oh, that's a long way. Yeah. And, but yeah. the other way was to go down to the end and walk along the railroad tracks. And I know we did that a fair amount and I have a photograph mm -hmm. of my brother and me wearing little backpacks and going to school <laughs> on the railroad tracks. Um, like hobos. <laughs> Did you have that? Yeah, and uh, I don't know if it was actually... Were there baby. a lot of trains at that time going through there? No. I, there were never a lot of trains, but I think there were more than there are now. Mm. Uh, I can't... That seems like that spur line, I don't know if it kept going. So yeah. It's a little it's, spur line going up to the face. It's something I, I feel like... I'm incredibly ignorant about. It. I should know more about where that went. Well, if you're not a, a train fan, then maybe. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> but it was a big part of our mm -hmm. lives sure. down there. Yeah. We, yeah. and in retrospect and in comparison to how kids are brought up now, our lives were crazy compared to today because <laughs> we basically. We were just set free. Right, right. No, and, and we're, not, we're, all, we're nearly the same age, and yeah, we were feral yeah. <laughs> for a while. So we yeah. just wandered, we just, and yeah. we're wandering yeah. on the railroad right. tracks. Yeah. Oh, no. And um, <laughs> and I, so we played down there all the time, mm -hmm. and you know we're always putting stuff on the tracks mm -hmm. to see it get smashed, um, and there were, and still are woods down there with lots of trails, and. Um, uh, one, one memory I have, which I've since asked other friends about to confirm the, you know, the details of this story, but there was a kid near, who lived nearby named Mickey Constantine, who was kind of a, I think he was a little younger than me, but he was a real character. He was a very outgoing kid, and he, with a big imagination, and he told everybody that he was Superman. And Superman was a big show on TV at that time. Everybody watched Superman. And uh, he told everybody he was Superman. And he, I think he had a cape. And he would play Superman around the neighborhood. And, he's, and one of the things, you know, at the beginning of, uh, you know, Superman, he, he, he's, 
he stops a train. Oh. <laughs> and uh, you know, we live right by the railroad oh, tracks. Oh no, I know what's coming. <laughs> so Mickey Constantine told everybody he was Superman and he oh. could stop a train. Oh. So one day, he tried to stop. He got out in the middle of the railroad tracks and held his hand up like this in front of the train, and the train stopped. And so he was vindicated. But Did you watch they picked this? him was up. This, well, this is the thing. Or this is I the story. You don't I remember can't remember if I actually saw him do it. I mean, I can see it in my mind. But he created such a. But he, they picked him up on the train and they took him down to the police station. <laughs> and then I think his parents had to come retrieve him. Uh, but it was like a legendary story for the kids in the neighborhood. Um, but. What else? So that was Perry Place. That was Perry Place. Yeah. Oh, the other thing, uh, one of the big events of my childhood there was uh, there was a, in the area where the, uh, well, I don't know what it is now, but it, most recently it was the Daily Messenger building. Things uh, for sale, right? Yeah, there was a big factory there, mm. which at the time was uh, GLF. And I think they sold feed, or, for livestock or, you know, packaged it or something. I'm not sure all of what they did, but, um, and I think that may have originally been part of the, the brewery, uh, uh, the former brewery complex uh, back before Prohibition. Uh, but there was a big fire there and uh, and the whole place went up and, you know, we all went over to watch and took pictures of it and that was a huge deal. And uh, there was also a guy who lived just about across the street from us who had some, his name was Mr. Tozer, which I always thought was an interesting name, <laughs> but he, he like sold fuel oil or something and the whole the neighborhood always smelled of fuel oil hmm. um, and I think I don't know when that all got taken down but we well, had the business right on Perry Place yeah the tanks and things or yeah I don't I don't remember the the details very well but I'd love to see some pictures of what was actually there but it was kind of a, you know, we we're down near the end of the street, mm -hmm. and it was sort of, you know, it was definitely nice. very residential, but we were also near the right next to this building. kind of industrial right, right. area and the, the train tracks. Yeah. Um, but, you know, the main thing was just, I remember how free we were to just do whatever we wanted outside. And... Um, but then uh, we, we ended up moving to Howell Street um, and uh, number 82 Howell Street mm -hmm. and we were super excited as kids. It was, it was a, a big house and uh, uh, and I remember the first time my brothers and I went in there, we just ran upstairs to like pick our bedrooms. And we all just like, without thinking, just like ran into rooms. <laughs> and it's like, this is mine, you know? And, and we ended up having those, you know, the rooms. getting those rooms that we ran into. You had into. your own bedroom? Was, how yeah. Many, how large is that house? Um, or was? Well, there were, there were four bedrooms, um, although then there, there was also, there was an addition on the back. Actually, I don't know if it was built at the same time or not, or if it was built later. It may have all been built at once, but but the part in the back had what had been a maid's room. Mm -hmm. And in fact, well, there were two stairways. There was a back stairway that was kind of hidden. Um, and then there was the main stairway that was kind of in an open hallway. And, uh, and I, you know, we were just like, oh my God. Secret back stairs. <laughs> it was so exciting. Oh yeah, you know that's that's one of the charms of our house. We have the we have the second the back stairs coming down into the kitchen. Not quite for maids purposes or servants, but to have two is yeah yeah, yeah. it's awesome. <laughs> it really is. Yeah. So our back stairs went down to the kitchen, right. or and and then at the top it had two doors, 
One went to this back bedroom that we never used. It. That ended up being kind of a playroom, but it wasn't, we didn't heat it. So it was mostly summer playroom. And then the other side, it went into a, a bedroom in the front part of the house, which, you know, it was a little smaller than the other room. So it seemed like maybe that had also been a servant's room. But it, uh, you know, if you're going to have like a maid for the front of the right. house or something, and then the cook lived right. in the yeah. back bedroom. I'm, not, I'm trying to visualize which house it is. So it's on the north? It's on the north, north side. It's red brick, red brick. Um, okay. Italianate. I Typical think it was built Powell. about 1870, yeah. I think. Most of those houses are, yeah, Victorian, 1850 forward, I think. Yeah. Most of them. Not all, but, yeah. I'm trying um, to visualize your optical look like. So, so you moved there. So, how long did you live at Howell Street? We lived there um, until, uh, well, my parents, uh, well, I graduated from high school in 1974. And, um, and I think my parents moved out of there in 1980, or right around there. They built a new house mm -hmm. on, um, what was an unnamed road. It's now Acorn Hill Drive. Um, my mom actually named it. Um, <laughs> but it's a little spur off of Weifel's Road. Okay. Um, and they built a new solar heated house there around, I think it was 1980. Um, but living on Howell Street, uh, Again, uh, you know, in retrospect, we had an incredible amount of freedom mm -hmm. and just were pretty much, my parents just did not supervise us <laughs> pretty much <laughs> at all, except when they were in the same room with us. And they both were very busy people. Mm -hmm. My dad. Uh, well, a doctor. So. Yeah, and he, he was, he probably worked 70, 80 hours a week and was, he would come home for dinner mm -hmm. and then he would go back to work. So we, and he had one afternoon off, Thursdays, Thursday afternoons, mm -hmm. and he would usually play golf uh, on that day. Mm -hmm. So we didn't really see him very much, except, you know, we always had dinner at mm -hmm. six o'clock. He was always home. And um, your mom was a teacher, you said? When did she start teaching? She, um, Well, she said she was home when you were younger. When yeah, you were growing up. and then she, um, I'm not sure if it was a requirement at that time or not, but she, uh, she had gotten a degree in art history from, uh, I'm going to space out the oh, name. I'm very interested though. <laughs> um, <laughs> this is really Alfred University. Really? Um, um, and she went there really, <laughs> she was a twin. And her sister wanted to become a nurse, and I guess they had a nursing school there, and mm -hmm. they decided, I think it was cheaper to send the two send of them, them to the same place. <laughs> so I don't think my mom really mm -hmm. wanted to go to Alfred, but they had a, easier. Yeah. They had a big, uh, uh, well actually, now that I think her degree was not art history uh, as an undergraduate, she was a, a studio art. Studio. Student probably did some art history. Yeah, and she was mainly into ceramics. I think that's the yes, that's a big program there still. Yeah. Yeah. Both at both university and state. So, yeah, ceramics the Corning has funded a lot of it. And that, that's um, interesting. I, I'm trying to remember when she. Well, then she so decided she she, she, she wanted to get a master's degree, okay. so she went to the University of Rochester for art history. Yeah. Oh. And um, did sure she when. do that while you were living at Howell Street? Or yeah, and I think she graduated around 1970 or 72, something mm -hmm. like that. I don't know. It'd be good to find that out, but yeah. And then she and then she went. To, and then she started teaching. Yeah, yeah then she then started teaching in, um, in what district? at uh, Marcus Whitman, oh. and uh, she continued as a art teacher. Um, 
sure when she retired, but a long time. Yeah. So she was doing this while you were in late elementary, junior high, high school. She was going back to school. And yeah. And, then, yeah. and um, but before that, she, I think my mom kind of wanted to be the ideal doctor's <laughs> wife kind of mm -hmm. thing. Mm -hmm. and. When I look back on all the stuff she was involved in, it really kind of blows my mind. Because mm -hmm. she, she ran for the school board, was on the school board for quite a while. She was also the uh, president of the Botanical Society, which at that time was pretty, I don't know, it, I know it still exists. And it, really active garden. But it was, very, garden. it was more active back then, I think, mm -hmm. although it was pretty much all old ladies uh, and my mom. <laughs> and, so she did a lot of volunteer work. Do yeah. you recall any other Yeah, she, she also, um, she and two of her friends, Casey Carpenter, who was the wife of another, of Jack Carpenter, who was another medical group, uh, he was a surgeon there. Uh, she was a music teacher mm -hmm. in the primary school. And then Jane Baker, who uh, had been an English teacher, the three of them organized this thing called the Lively Arts Committee or Commission. I don't know what it was exactly, but they um, put on uh, concerts at in the auditorium of what is what was the high school. Right, <laughs> I don't know which what has been renovated. Right now. Yeah, yeah, it's, yeah, it's now been, been renovated yeah, right, as the yeah. Fort Hill Whatever. Performing Arts Center. <laughs> But yeah, that was yeah. uh, a huge thing mm -hmm. in our childhood, um, was these concerts. Because my mom was always, you know, they were always having meetings mm -hmm. to organize them, and then we got to go to them. And, um, and they were a big part of our childhood, and I think, uh, you know, really enriching yeah, experience, because yeah. we got exposed to all kinds of performers of various kinds. And I had one particular memory. Uh, you know, we so we grew up on Howell Street, and uh, the high school at that time it was the junior high school. Right, it became the junior high. Yeah, yeah. And all the time I was, well, the after Howell, we moved to Howell Street, the, about, was about the same time they were changing from yeah. building the new new academy. Right. At that time, moving, the new academy was, was yeah. opened in. 62, I think. I think so, yeah, around there. Or that's when it was built, I think. Yeah. I'm, but it, I'm trying to visualize the date that's great. Yeah. And I remember going Early there on 60s. a tour before it opened mm -hmm. and then seeing it brand new and all shiny, and it, we were all very impressed. Mm -hmm. um, but it had a tiny little auditorium that was pretty much useless for any kind of large scale. They must have event. expanded that then because. Uh, that building has a big one now. Yeah, but it was, well, they called it the multi-purpose room. Oh. <laughs> and it only held about 200 people, I think. Uh -huh. um, so all the, you know, theatrical productions and everything That's still deep. went on at what became the junior high school. Junior academy, right. And um, so that's where they put on these lively arts mm -hmm. uh, council mm -hmm. uh, Your mom was events. Involved. Yeah, and so... Um, so we went to every performance because mom organized them, and um, and I remember <laughs> again it's like I can't imagine this kind of thing happening now. But you know, to us, it, we we would go over there through the back lots. Mm -hmm. We didn't go all the oh, way around. You know, we're kids. When you're kids, cut through uh, yards. Yeah, right, you right, think right, the right. whole world is yeah. you know available. Yeah, right. So we would walk through the back lots to get over there, and I remember. Uh, Dick Gregory, uh, who was at that time a pretty prominent comedian, political comedian, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. you know, he'd been on the Smothers Brothers yeah, show and yeah. various other shows. We'd seen him on TV and he came for one of these lively arts things. And I went over there with my dog to the show. And uh, <laughs> dogs at that time were welcome was, everywhere. Yeah, this <laughs> or was, they ran feral too. Yeah, right? this is another like big change. Right, right. Um, yeah, dog. There was no leash law, right. and dogs just wandered all over town, mm -hmm. and there was dog poop mm -hmm. everywhere. Mm -hmm. um, and <laughs> but anyway, my dog 
uh, went with me. I remember my, my dog went with me to school sometimes and then would just walk home or wait for me outside. Um, but she came with me to the Dick Dick Gregory, Gregory show. show. And I don't think I had her on a leash. And I just took her in with me. And I sat in the front row with my dog. And, Do you know um, how old you were? I was about 11, I think. Okay. All right. Um, I would, that'd be easy to date because I'm sure they'll Yeah, I want to yeah. find yeah. the schedule. Yeah, yeah. And because, so you were there with your dog. And, um, and I'm watching the show and I was very entertained. And then suddenly, you know, Dick's looking over to the side and my dog is on stage <laughs> with Dick Gregory. She had just wandered off and went up the steps. And what kind of dog was it? She was a mutt. Okay. Actually, yeah. her picture is out. In oh, the, is it? Uh, oh, here in front the front here. Okay, oh, she's display. famous. Okay. Yeah, her name was Pickles, and she was very friendly, and she just walked over to Dick Gregory and, and said hello, and, Dick, oh. and he was like, oh, hi. And I was just mortified. I said, oh, my God. What about what? your mom? What would she think? Well, <laughs> it, it, it turned out okay, but I was incredibly embarrassed, and I had to... Well, not really, but I had to go up on stage to get my dog, and I just, just like, oh my, you know, I just had to like sneak off somehow and then hold on to her for the rest of the show. But in a way, it worked out great because afterwards, you know, that was the high point of the show for a lot of people. She was a star. You know, it was like, and Dick, you know, came was over was afterwards, and we were yeah. talking to him, and he was like petting my dog and. And I felt this real connection with Dick Gregory forever after that. And I was like, <laughs> I know that guy. He's so head of my dog. They had some major performers, and that'd be interesting to know more about. Yeah. Yeah. If it's, it's local history, I don't know. So Do you have programs and things from your mom? Is your mom no, still living? No. Both of my parents have passed. Um, but my mom was also, uh, she was a big golfer and tennis player. Um, you know, they used to have a, like a tournament for, you know, tennis tournament mm -hmm. for Canandaigua, and she, she was a very good tennis player, mm -hmm. and she wanted to, you know, win the whole thing. Mm -hmm. But and she got second place two or three times. She was about forty at the time, mm -hmm. and the woman who beat her lived across the street. Uh, Patty B. A. She was eighteen, so it was so it was big. Big deal. <laughs> Big age difference. But we thought, well, pretty good, Mom. Yeah, you know, <laughs> the only one who can beat you is this hot shot. He's 18. Um, and she was uh, a, a real top golfer at Bristol Harbor. I think she was the women's champion there a few times. And uh, um, what else are you well, um, <laughs> where well, are we at now? Kind of, I just, um, yeah, it, maybe oh. knowing the neighborhood, you know, from not sure what memories you might have of things like, I know there used to be block parties on Howell, there, the homecoming parade assembled there, um, Halloween, when we moved here to Canandaigua, our neighbors on Fort Hill made a big deal about Halloween on Howell Street because the legend was that there were houses that gave you full candy bars, <laughs> basically as many as you wanted. <laughs> so, I don't remember my kids ever coming back with full candy bars from Howell Street, but um, so just kind of maybe uh, if you have you know, thinking about um, yeah other things about the neighborhood itself, um, where you used to you know play what the Sonnenberg Gardens, the, oh, the yeah. park um, that you know any change changes you've noticed, of course. Well, um, especially in retrospect, I realize what an enormous influence uh, the Thompsons had on my life. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Fred and Mary Thompson, who built Sonnenberg, their summer home. Uh, and because, you know, growing up on Howell Street, if you go down to the end of the street, there are these giant gates and uh, that lead into the Sonnenberg estate. And uh, at that time, it was all owned by the Veterans Administration. Right. So we, we called that the VA. VA. Everything was VA. Yeah. 
and what we call Sonnenberg was Sonnenberg Park, mm -hmm. which uh, they had built uh, in exchange for closing off, uh, as partial exchange for closing off Howell Street at the end and making it private for their own use. Uh, <clears throat> but yeah, when we were kids, those gates were always closed, and, but there were these little pedestrian gates on the side, and one of them was always open, <laughs> just enough so somebody could get in there. Mm -hmm. And um, and that was a, kind of our playground. And I don't think we realized what an incredible, you know, how incredibly lucky we were. Because basically we got to play in a billionaire's estate, you know, <laughs> as our, that was our playground. Mm -hmm. um, and uh Did you get caught in trouble for him? Um I mean how I much did the VA patrol and, and they maintain didn't, all they that? They didn't seem to that end of it. I we may have gotten chased out of there a couple of times. I don't remember that happening, but I think it probably did. Um but there were not a lot of, you know, there was little to no security. It was basically the, the thing to be concerned about was, you know, there were a lot of veterans living at the hospital at that time. Right. I don't know what, I'm sure that was the, the peak, those were the peak years. Yeah, of, and it was more of a functioning hospital too. Yeah, yeah. and, and the, the mansion was used as nurses quarters, um, it was divided up into apartments. And so basically, we just, but we felt pretty as, free to roam. As kids, you probably yeah, didn't have that same. <laughs> yeah, we, we didn't <laughs> hang around around the mansion right, too right. much because there were people yeah, there and we right. wanted to avoid people because yeah. we didn't want to get kicked out. But we rode our bikes around there all the time. Mm -hmm. And I know other kids um, a little older than I and maybe a little more adventurous used to climb over into the. Uh, the uh, swimming pool that was kind of, it was like a Roman bath. Mm -hmm. um, I never did that, but I heard about other kids doing it. But it was just an incredible place to explore. Mm -hmm. And, you know, there was the, the, the cast iron tower over the rose garden mm -hmm. and, um, yeah. you know, statues. The structures, that, yeah, the tea house and all that, yeah. Yeah, one thing I remember though was uh, it was really, the, the VA did not really, all they did was pretty much mow the lawn. They yep. did not yeah. maintain the place. And, uh, and there was vandalism. And uh, my mom was really concerned about the place going downhill. Right. And, and some of the statues had been knocked over. Um, she actually did a series of photos, little sometime in the 60s, I remember, and I think it was kind of, I, well, I associate it with uh, Lady Bird Johnson mm -hmm. and this program to beautify America. America. Beautiful, right? yeah. Yeah. yeah, and so there was this big, you know, anti-littering campaign that happened. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and I have somewhere, I think, a bunch of the photographs that my mom took where she kind of wanted to show people, you know, what a mess we've made of Canandaigua. And I don't think people would believe what's in these photographs if you saw them now. Have you, have you taken them to Sonnenberg? Well, I don't, I, I'm not sure here. where they are oh, right now, but oh. I have a lot of for photos that, and negatives and stuff. That's really valuable information. And Visual uh, history there. <clears throat> yeah. That, that would be really important. Well, yeah. wow, I hope she, those. Yeah, I, I found well, a couple of She's part of the Botanical them. Garden Society, so that would, nor, I see, can see why she would. But um, I remember there were huge piles of beer bottles mm -hmm. and and broken down cars, just inside jumped. the V, inside the Sonnenberg. No, not in Sonnenberg. Oh, but, not in Sonnenberg. But, yeah, but oh, around, around Canada. Around, but, right. But in Sonnenberg, in, in Sonnenberg, there were beer bottles, right. and I remember yeah. somebody had taken a beer bottle and stuck it up in one of the statues, <laughs> so it looked like she was drinking a beer. Um, and I know I, your mom has a picture I have a photo of that somewhere. Oh, oh gosh. But she went up there one day, I don't think I was 
there, but she took our station wagon, drove up there, and there was a, a statue that had fallen down. She just loaded it into the station wagon and took it home and put it in the back in our oh, garden this is still for there. safekeeping. What happened and to it? It was returned okay. later. You know, after uh, <laughs> Wes Gifford, I think, was the guy who spearheaded the initial phase of oh, the renovating. Renovating over there. Yeah, and and at that time there was the was call went out. It's like anybody who's taken stuff, oh bring it back, because we had a head of some other statue that was on our mantle for a while, and that stuff got returned. Um, but. Uh, it was an incredible place to play, mm -hmm. and um, and then uh, what else? Well, I was wondering about you know the activities around there, you know, like homecoming oh. and different things in the general neighborhood. I mean, did you spend any time at Evans Field yourself? Uh, I used to go up there for football games. I was not a big sports fanatic, but I do, you know. Uh, I really liked having Evans Field there in the middle of town mm -hmm. and having the, you know, I, I'm one of those people that if I, I, I didn't live in Canandaigua at the time when people were trying to figure out what to do about Evans Field, but I definitely would have been somebody saying, let's keep it, keep football there mm -hmm. because it was so great to be able to just walk over right. to go see right. a football game instead of driving to the very edge of town. And I thought it was good. You know, everybody in the middle of town hears the cheering and the band and everything. I thought that was great. Um, but I didn't live right next he door. Didn't, he it. didn't live on I top lived of a block away. He so. lived on, I was right, and, and realizing what's happened is even people who live in the general vicinity of Evansfield would drive over. I mean, oh. Yeah. I mean, I know people that live just a couple streets away, they would drive and park closer to Evansfield. That that walking to Evansfield nostalgia. <laughs> yeah. Well, that's was another... Not, I mean, I understand living, if you live in the neighborhood or if you're right in town, and people did used to walk, right? People used yeah. to walk from all over town. That's but another thing that, that has... That, that, Changed enormously yeah. from yeah. when we I mean, were, and that speaks out. I mean, your perception too of what growing up there in Howell and literally having the run of the neighborhoods. In my experience, where I grew up, same. I wasn't. I was near a field, not in a city, but um, being able to run free and things. That's just yeah. That's a major change. I wonder if you like any other observations you have about the changes over there. And have you visited the house? Um, I did visit it um, around 10 years ago. Um, there was, uh, <laughs> well, at the time, <clears throat> my girlfriend at the time had grown up on Howell Street also. Uh, uh, and I think we were, and her parents still lived there. So we were, we were at their house quite frequently. We had dinner there a lot. And there was a block party going on one night. There were I don't remember ever having block parties when I was a kid. But that that thing it was a thing for a while. It did over there. start I, up and I, yeah, I don't know if it's yeah. still going on. No, but it, no, I mean not that I can recall the last even maybe ten years, but they've had they did have them some subsequent to us moving there in two thousand four. Sometime they ended but Prior to COVID, it wasn't COVID really. They just, I think they maybe safety or the city said, no, you can't close the street down or whatever. Right. Yeah. But we, but we ended up. recall a few. Yeah, well, we, we walked down to this one and it would seem to be centered right about where my old house was. Mm -hmm. So we went down there and we were hanging out and talking to people. And, and at that, I think. It's still the same family that owns it. It's the Del Ducas. Uh, and they were, I think, the second or third family to own it after we lived there. And the people who got it uh, right after us didn't really maintain it too well, and it had there had been some deterioration. But then the Del Ducas 
fixed it up, although they really changed it. Mm -hmm. But uh, I ended up meeting them that night, and they and I told them, yeah, I grew up here, and, and they invited me to come in and look around. They didn't let me go upstairs, uh, unfortunately. <laughs> yeah, but I did see the downstairs, mm -hmm. and uh, they had moved the kitchen from the back to what had been our kind of family room, TV uh, room, uh, uh, which I thought was kind of crazy. Ambitious. Yeah, and they had put <laughs> in, the you know, really made it far fancier. And then the back where the kitchen had been, I don't know, it had turned into kind of a big mud room, I think. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and they had taken out the back stairs, uh, which I, I think, uh, <laughs> which I just couldn't believe. They're um, so handy. Yeah. But um, it was interesting to mm -hmm. see it. Um, and, but what, as far as memories of growing up there, mm -hmm. though, Sonnenberg Park was a huge part of our lives. Uh, we spent a lot of time there. And at that time, they still had, uh, back when Mrs. Thompson got it started, she hired people to work there and mm -hmm. just, you know, play with the kids and teach them games and organize events and stuff. Mm -hmm. And there was still some of that going on. There was a guy who would, you know, they had one of the little buildings, uh, had a bunch of games and stuff that he would mm -hmm. get out every day. And so there was a lot of activity going on down there. And um, one of the things uh, when I tell people who didn't grow up in Canandaigua about growing up here, there's a few things that I think people find kind of hard to believe. One is uh, the naked swimming at the uh, in the oh I've heard the, of that in, in the, the, the pool, academy the, pool yeah. yes yes I've for heard boys of that. only but uh, no the girls had I guess girls, to share girls <laughs> share shared swim, swimming uh, yeah these yeah. horrible they had a pile of them apparently up yeah, yeah that, I, I mean, think the they pool. were wool but what what I'm sure. they, they, yeah probably <laughs> from yeah 1900 yes I've heard I've heard that. But all, so they had separate swimming for boys right, and girls, right. and the boys all swam naked. I'm not sure when that ended, but, uh, <laughs> you know, today you just think, what? How, how did they get away with that? But um, the other thing, one of the other things was the uh, the jungle gym. Yes, I was going to ask you about Park. that. Was, was that still uh, in standing when you moved? Yeah, and um, I think it came down sometime in the 80s. Mm. Uh, but, and I have a couple of photographs that show the original one, which was made out of wood. Mm -hmm. And then at the time we lived there, there was the new version, <laughs> think, which was made different. out of cast iron pipe. Mm -hmm. And it was the biggest jungle gym, gym I've ever seen. I think seen. biggest, probably set a record. I've yeah, seen pictures the thing of it. is huge. And yeah. it was terrifying. I'm sure it was. And, <laughs> And, you know, it was just sand underneath it, so it if you tough. fell off, you would land on sand, but, and it had, you know, Tarzan. And ropes and everything. Ropes and yeah. iron rings and trapeze and all kinds of stuff. And it was crazy. Uh, I was wondering how many Canada kids went on to the circus after that. Yeah. <laughs> but he's figured that out. Um, that I was I was wondering if that was if you had experience with it because um, I've seen pictures of it. It was amazing. It was an incredible thing. Uh, any any other memories uh, things you want to share? Well, at this point? yeah, a couple of I, I meant to mention yeah. earlier. The reason we ended up coming to Canada was because my uh, my great uncle, my father's uncle. Richard was the minister at the Congregational Church, and uh, he was the minister there for 28 years. I'm not sure what, I think it, he, they moved here in the 40s, although I'm not sure about the date. Um, so, yeah, he, so he ran the Congregational Church. His wife, Gertrude, uh, ran the Sunday school. And uh, do you remember their name? Yeah, Richard Herkimer 
Bowen was the Bowen. minister. Okay, the whistle of Bowen. Yeah, and Gertrude uh, Menzel, I guess she has a middle name too, but her maiden name was Menzel, mm -hmm. was his wife, and they lived in the Parsonage, which was on Park Street, uh, which is no longer the Parsonage. They don't really have don't Parsonage as much yeah. anymore. No. But that was a, a great old house too. Mm -hmm. I think, you know, and this gets me back to, you know, talking about freedom as a kid, uh, being able to wander everywhere. I was a very entitled kid, but I didn't realize it <laughs> growing up. But, uh, you know, because my great uncle, well, because my dad worked Stop. at the medical yeah. group, we got yes. to wander all over the medical group and they had these old wheelchairs in there that were from the 19th century, I think. They were wooden wicker things, and we had wheelchair races down in the basement. But we felt free to wander around in there, and to some extent in the hospital. Um, the church. And then in the church, yeah. And, um, and my, my great uncle and his wife had a son named Richard, who was a teacher at the academy and became an administrator there. So it was like we kind of had an inn in all the institutions in town and felt free to wander everywhere, um, which was a great feeling yeah. as a kid. Yeah. You know, it felt like we really belonged, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so is that the only connection family wise to the area that you know of? Um, I know you've done family research. So yeah. But um, you had a great uncle here. That was the that's your only sort of ancestral roots that you for Canada. Yeah. That was one of my questions actually back from that too. So great. Um, I guess um, let's do some, something more you want to conclude with, or or um, we can wrap it up. If you're ready. I'm, I'm hoping this helped jog your memories for your family history project, um, and already some really great local history things you seem to have possibly possession of would be, would be wonderful to share with the community. Yeah, I pictures have a, of Sandra, I have a lot of especially postcards of yeah. Canandaigua that Your I started. Your mom's photos though sound yeah, like I something I need really, to find those. really um, precious. I think those are really valuable. Historically significant because I yeah, really well, don't think people would believe what it looked like no, here. No, it, um, it was a mess. Well, and it wasn't in great repair when we moved here in 2004 either, and so much has changed since. Um, it, the garden structures were all in, in disrepair. It really, yeah, in ruin, mm. um, even, even up till then, so it's, um, but even but for historical preservation purposes, they may be able to identify things too that are either lost or where they, they need to go because of those photos. That's just super valuable. Yeah, like one of the photos, I have just three or four that I found, and one shows a house uh, that no longer exists, mm -hmm. um, yeah. which uh, I now own the former Salt and Stall Street schoolhouse, and there was a house just to the east of it, which disappeared yeah. some time between <laughs> now and the 60s. Right, yeah. But I have a photo of it, and I actually posted it on Facebook and said, hey, does anybody know anything about this house? Because it's not even on the it's maps not, Maybe even on the, the, yeah, the old. Yeah. yeah. Wonderful. Well, I think um, that's a lead to it. <laughs> Thank you for doing it. And um, okay. I hope this, <laughs> hope it's valuable. <laughs> this historic, historical uh, 